Hello, everybody. How many of you watched the Commander-in-Chief Forum last night? You heard the name Matt Olson. There are a lot of Matt Olsons in the world. This is the Matt Olson that Hillary Clinton <laughs> referred to. I just want to make that very clear last night. We were at, we were at dinner, and his, his, his iPhone just began buzzing like crazy, and it's because uh, he was mentioned uh, without warning. Uh, so congratulations for that. Is Thank that good for much. you, or is it bad? I don't bad? know if it's good or not. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It can't be bad, I suppose. Your uh, mother is so My proud. mom is happy, right. <laughs> so we... we I recently had a conversation with a senior national security official, very senior in this administration, who went off on you know, issues related to Syria and China and kind of the global problems. And at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, but the issue that we just are having to get our heads around, and it's so, so serious, if you, he said, if you know what I know, is cyber. Uh, and I think he was talking about things far and beyond uh, even our democracy potentially being hacked. But I'm interested in the world in which you are. We're, we're 15 years later, Suzanne, uh, after 9-11. 15 years ago, we weren't carrying all these smartphones. We weren't nearly as densely connected as we are today. And when one looks at the kind of high profile, whether it's you know, the information from uh, health companies or Target or uh, various sorts of things that, that we've been able to uh, uh, learn about Sony and its interactions vis-a-vis via, -vis North Korea. It looks like this is a pretty crappy situation for the world that we've inherited in terms of the denseness. So I'm interested in, given what you do, how do you prioritize this cyber world? Because it's become such a catch-all for all sorts of things. But what are our national security priorities today as you look at it? Steve, that is a great question, um, because that's exactly the way you have to approach this. The cybersecurity challenge is so huge that if you don't prioritize your efforts, uh, you're, you're never going to make progress on it. And, and the prioritization, let me just say from the department's perspective, I know the secretary mentioned this morning one of our top organizational and legislative priorities is to uh, work with Congress to be able to stand up the first operational components since the creation of the department, a, a cyber and infrastructure protection agency. The operational work that I'm going to talk about today is currently undertaken by a headquarters component uh, that I lead called National Protection and Programs Directorate. Uh, and it's an outstanding group of, of men and women working very hard every day. Uh, but they, they are engaged in operational activity, and it's very important that we recognize the importance of that by standing up this operational component. And so we are working with Congress to make that happen. That operational activity is prioritized in the cyber arena. Um, first, look at uh, getting our federal house in order. Right, so we, we work very hard with our departments How many and years will that take? Well, right, it will be a work in progress forever. Yeah. Uh, but we have made great progress on that, actually. And so we lead uh, the, the efforts to help all the departments and agencies to improve their cybersecurity, and we do that in a variety of ways. We've deployed a, ser a set of uh, tools that help with the perimeter and inside your network. We have best practices. We have binding operational directives that require adoption of best practices like prompt patching. Uh, and we have automated information sharing uh, of threat indicators. Lots of tools and ways in which we're working with the DACA. A lot of work still to go. Uh, Not to interrupt, but if you were to grade governments and agencies on their prep, who would you give an A to and who would you give an F to? I get that question all the time and I Really? I never... thought it was an original question. <laughs> no, sorry to burst your bubble, Steve. <laughs> but I never answer that question ah. uh, because our work with both the federal departments and with the private sector is, you know, it really depends on trust. Hmm. And, and we are not going to uh, continue to maintain that trust if whether it's a department or an agency or a state or local official or uh, a private sector company that we assist and then we run in front of the microphones and we tell everybody about it uh, and, and, and throw mm -hmm. people under the bus. So we don't do that. We do have internally, we do look at how folks are doing and we have ways of uh, metrics uh, to, 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 to see whether we're in fact improving cybersecurity uh, in the ways that we need to. Our, uh, be, af, you know, in addition to the .gov, right. we have the lead for working with critical infrastructure owners and operators all across the country. And, and there we have uh, to prioritize our efforts as well. And we do it in the same way that we tell all of our stakeholders to prioritize their efforts. And that is looking at a risk management approach 
not starting with your IT professionals who are, who are going to just talk to you about your IT, but starting with the people who understand your business. In government, what are your mission mm -hmm. essential functions? In business, what is the business that you are about? And then what are your cyber dependencies? How could cyber affect the most important things that you do and that you care about? How do you identify those high value assets? So you're gonna do basic cyber hygiene, that'll get 85 to 90% of the malicious activity, and then with that last 10 or 15%, you've got to prioritize your efforts. That means bringing your folks who are your physical experts, your business experts, and your IT folks to the table to make those risk prioritization decisions. Thank you. Let me ask uh, all of you, but, but I want to jump to Matt. Matt, I'm intrigued by your new company. I mean, you used to run the Counterterrorism Center. Now you run IronNet, uh, uh, is that right? IronNet Security. And I am interested, is that IronNet, you know, when we think about how the public ought to think about its vulnerability, how to think about you know, what Suzanne was just talking about in terms of cyber exposure. I remember when Al Gore would talk a lot about the lockbox right. uh, mm -hmm. and, and you know, the confidence we could have that you could put money in a box. I mean, are, are you setting yourself up for failure even in the name of your company that, that to have this notion that we can be so capable that in fact that's setting up the wrong expectations, that we're gonna be in a situation where we're always kind of tilting towards disaster on cyber? Well, it, yeah, I mean, it's a great question because, I mean, I hope we're not setting ourselves up for failure with the name of the company, but it, there, is a, there is a sense that, uh, for sure, the, 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 the cyber threat is so complicated. I think it's really great to look back at today, you know, and think back 15 years ago and, mm -hmm. and the terrorism threat and look at how, when I was at the National Counterterrorism Center, we looked at how that threat had really changed so much in the last 12, now 15 years, uh, where it's become more diverse, the terrorism threats become more expansive, and mm -hmm. it's become the threats adapted. That's on the terrorism side. Now look at cyber. And all of those same features, I think, characterize the cyber threat. You have increasingly sophisticated actors. You have criminal gangs who are you know, at the level of what we would have thought were just the capability of nation states a few years ago. Uh, you have the nature of those attacks changing from uh, simply disruptive to businesses to destructive, you know, destroying right. data, destroying hardware. So one of the things that we think about and, and where I am now is the, the challenge is that the offense has the advantage and typically the offense wins. And it's, and it's a little bit, again, like terrorism. When I was at the National Counterterrorism Center, I didn't typically talk about the fact that it's really basically impossible to stop every terrorism attack. Um, but that's the, the truth. And Suzanne, your point about risk management, it applies in the terrorism realm. You're managing risk, but you're, the same thing applies in the cybersecurity realm. You are managing risk. You can't stop every terrorism attack. You can do the things that Suzanne Did you discussed. see President Obama kind of you know, beat his chest the other day and said that, that our cyber capabilities beat everybody else's by far? Uh, and we were talking about this last night. Right. I'm interested if you were to rank the next biggest cyber threat to the United States on a scale of one to 10, if the United States is 10, where would you put the next biggest threat after, after the president's comments? And, and, and were you happy that the president said that? Yeah, I, th well, I think that's right what the president said in terms of our capabilities relative to the rest of the world. There's a, there's a number of ways of measuring that is that, you know, sort of offensive cyber capabilities, defensive cyber cap capabilities, but overall, we're ahead of the rest of the world. But we do have some significant adversaries, uh, particularly uh, at the nation state level with China and Russia, Iran, North Korea, and you can tick off the attacks that are either knowingly uh, uh, attributable to those uh, governments or suspected to be those governments and, and their legion. Uh, but below that level, then, you know, you have to rank the most pervasive type of attack are basically criminals. Uh, you know, the, the attack on target, uh, according to the press, you know, that, that attack, which was quite significant, really cost a few thousand dollars uh, in terms of the malware that was available on the internet. And that's now a couple years ago. So those groups are getting increasingly sophisticated. Scale of one to 10, next biggest threat? You know, I'd say, the, you know, if we're a 10, and I would say the next biggest threat is in the seven, eight area. So it, it, given that, and, and, and Susan, I, I don't know if you have thoughts in this realm too, it raises the interesting question that when you're in this sort of new world of of, of, of the ability to create consequences with cyber capabilities in another country, in another government, to another electric grid, which we've already seen happen in Ukraine, uh, and arguably we saw it happen with Stuxnet in, in Iran, with centrifuges, uh, whoever made that Stuxnet virus, I don't know. But, but uh, when you're at that level, what do you think when it, when it 
when it comes to this, these allegations about Russia and, and hacking our democracy, do you think the U.S. government could send a signal by hacking the Chinese, you know, Politburo and the, you know, Putin's office or where, so where it, could it, it go? it depends on what effect you want to achieve. Um, and if you want to up the, the ante, we're more vulnerable because we're more, more engaged in cyber. Hmm. And that may not be the right way to go. So the Chinese signed an agreement with the U.S. and they signed the agreement in large part because it was in their interest. They wanted to damp down the amount of communication and the amount of democracy that was happening in China as a result of cyber. And hmm. so this was the, to their advantage. Right now, it's not to Putin's advantage to damp down things. But we can send signals through quiet channels, not necessarily publicly. I want to move back to something that Suzanne and, and Matt were talking about. With cyber, it's often what we want to think about is resiliency rather than reliability. So if you think about the power grid, the power grid has always operated on the idea that if one, one generating system is down, the system should work. Resiliency mm. is if a number of them are down, it should mm. work. But resiliency is also if some of them go down, if we have the situation like we had in Ohio a few years ago that started right. with a tree and then, and then a snow barrel, a snow barrel what happens? How do you come back up? How do you come back up quickly? What are the right ways to build cyber to enable resiliency? And that's something that we have not built in 15 years ago, but something that we really need to have now. And that's something that I, I'm sure how your agency is I mean, just, just in a, you know, with all of you, how vulnerable do you think our national, uh, say, electric grid infrastructure is? Suzanne, so how actually, good a job are you doing preventing? We are doing yeah, such yeah. a great job. <laughs> uh, but, but what we, is your biggest blind spot? Well, uh, let, let me say, the, we, I, I, I'm serious when I say I actually think we are doing a, a very good job at, in, with working with the electricity sector, and that is in large part because the private sector, uh, our, our partners in mm. the electricity subsector particularly, are very forward-leaning and very aggressive about this. And so I actually am leaving in a mm. few hours to head to New Mexico for a quarterly meeting with about 30 or 40 CEOs from across mm. the electricity uh, sector who come together uh, to meet with us on a very regular basis to talk about how we work together to continue to improve the security and resilience of our electric grid. And a lot of that work is uh, led by our Assistant Secretary, Caitlin Durkovich. Uh, but this is, this, so our electric grid is actually much more redundant and resilient uh, than people give it credit for. But I will say what we are very mindful of is that part of a, a great deal of that resilience comes from the fact that so much of it was built in the 70s before we were cyber dependent. Uh, the cyber uh, efficiencies, if you will, have been tacked on. Uh, and so when those go down, often there is that physical mitigation, that physical redundancy that you can turn, rely back on. Uh, as we get upgrade that, uh, as that ends in its useful life and we upgrade that and we move to smart grid, et cetera, we've got to be much more mindful that we are doing this in a way that preserves that resilience, which is critically important. And that won't always be an IT solution. Right. Right. Oftentimes right. that resilience will come from putting in a hand crank, having paper copies, things like that. And one of Going the things, back to cash. What, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> one of the Susan? things one needs to think about in an attack is right now the attackers pick the time that they're going to go after Target, they're going to go after Sony. If you talk about a hybrid attack on a bunch of systems, they don't necessarily have the advantage because they have to get at the power grid and the banking system or whatever else they're going to at the same time. And that's a much harder job to do than when they go after Sony or they go after Target on their own calendar, on their, their own instant. Let's talk about good Which guys. Which makes us somewhat more secure uh, as a result. Let's talk about good guys and bad guys for a minute. You know, I, you know some, the way I look at I remember we did a talk when the Sony North Korea thing was unfolding. The Atlantic did a forum with Lisa Monaco and Fran Townsend, and Fran pretty much lambasted Sony and said, Sony, you know, there, there, there are criticisms all around that can be shared, but one of the things is Sony did nothing that it should have been doing along the right. cyber level and really, really cast a lot of the blame on the private sector side of that equilibrium and who, who, and I'm interested, you know, on the, on the good guy side of this, which is a public that doesn't want to be ripped off or have its emails taken or have its, you know, operation system suspended. What is their responsibility to protect themselves from malicious people? And what is the government's responsibility to deal with North Korea, Iran, China? I mean, it, it seems to me that we talk a lot about companies and what they need to do, but they can't match a government. 
Suzanne? So, uh, you know, I come at this from the notion of comparative advantage, mm. right? So, you know, we've often talked about roles and responsibilities and, 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 and kind of we're going to dictate that in a kind of command and control way that I think comes out of the military context, which is not really appropriate here. Um, but we do need to come to the table and understand what each of us in the private sector and, and at all levels of government bring to the table. Right. Uh, in terms of comparative advantage. So we have a comparative advantage with regard to deterring state action, which is, mm -hmm. and I think we succeeded in doing that in the agreement that we were able to reach with China on economic espionage. Um, and companies have uh, the comparative advantage mm -hmm. with respect to the immediate protection of their systems and networks. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to work together on response, and we're now developing uh, right. with the private sector additional playbooks and annexes for that uh, response in which we have to understand, right. again, what resources each of us brings to the table and how we're going to work together. Matt? Yeah, I, I think I, mean, I agree with, with Suzanne in terms of relative advantage, the, but the, the challenge is that this is, I mean, to your point, Steve, the we put a lot of burden on the, on the private sector. Um, in a way, if you, again, going back to the analogy to terrorism, we would not uh, say the same thing about the private sector's responsibility to protect itself against a terrorist attack. If you think about a terrorist attack, a physical attack against a facility or a company, it's, it's pretty clear what the gov U.S. government's role is. And it's actually well organized, at least better organized than it was 15 years ago. And I think we're getting there with cyber, but I still think we have a ways to go really to understand what is the responsibility of the private sector? How much can they do themselves? But what's the responsibility of the U.S. government uh, when you have a nation state uh, undertaking an attack against uh, a U.S. company on, on U.S. soil? And going back to the point I made before, the, you know, it's very difficult for these companies to be able to defend themselves against the level of cyber attack that we face uh, from sophisticated actors like mm -hmm. uh, Susan, North so Korea. Before you answer, because we're going to get the audience in a minute, but I want, with whatever you're about to say, I know you've been thinking a lot about crypto cryptography, the cryptography, right. and, and, and what we're beginning to see out there on the bad guy side of the equation is going dark. And, and, right. and the inability, you know, that there's, a, there's now a reaction out in the drug lord world and in the ISIS world and, and, and other sides of kind of nefarious networks basically going off the grid. So let me, I'll, I'll take that, I'll be delighted to take that, but let me just add a little bit. I have known, my colleagues have known for years, that anything we don't want on the front page of the New York Times mm. or the Washington Post, we don't put an email. Sony executives didn't seem to know that. Mm. Sony films have been leaked to places, not like YouTube anymore, which doesn't show those things, but, but uh, before, uh, before being shown in movie theaters for a long time. And so there are, I completely agree with, with Matt and Suzanne that a company can't withstand a nation state attack. Mm. Um, maybe a large company that's in the, in the defense industrial base should be but able to. But you're saying we should live with a little bit of fear about what we but, do. But there are certain kinds of elementary precautions that mm. simply weren't there. Right. Going dark. Um, the FBI has been talking about going dark for 20 years. So how have things changed in the last 15? Well, in 2001, of course, we had what happened. But we also had in 2000 the change in export controls that allowed companies to put strong cryptography into their systems for export. And that also made it easier to have strong cryptography available domestically. Now, here's where I get to actually lambast the companies, because the computer companies didn't really start doing that um, as a standard thing until post Snowden. This is not completely true. Google was uh, beginning to protect its co between data centers communications with cryptography, but it's only in the post Snowden era. Mm. But if you look at the extent to which we've gone, as you started this session, the extent to which we've gone to communicating electronically, we right. all carry smartphones in our pockets, we all have computers in our pockets. There's 80% penetration in the United mm. States of smartphones. There's also BlackBerry's gone out of business, essentially. Right. Okay? And BlackBerry had a secure communication system. The smartphones have not. And what we had is, to a certain extent, the government was, was playing two right. sides. You could, you could use cryptography, but then the FBI kept saying they're going dark. What I've seen, very sotto voce, but, very, but quite clearly, is that the NSA and the defense side mm. of the government has said, you know, cryptography, ubiquitous cryptography, securing everything, is really important. You need mm. it, you need to secure the communications, but you also need to secure the devices, partially because they're crucial for second factor authentication. I kind of wish we had another hour or two. 
Uh, let so me we open need. So can I just say one quick yeah, thing on that? Uh -huh. we, I, I'm, I'm with Susan on, on the importance of encryption and the value of that to our communications. Right. It's a real problem in the terrorism front that there are uh, that there are communications occurring between ISIS fighters uh, that are encrypted and that we can't see, and we that's a see. real serious problem. And you're telling us we really, really, really we can't really, see them. We really, really, really can't see them. We're not just telling them that's we can't not, see them. That's not. That is a real problem for yeah. the FBI I, I, and, for the, I and for the intelligence Matt. community. I have some thoughts, but uh, let's okay, let's Okay, great. Let me open up the floor for questions and comments real quickly. Yes, right out in the back, this young lady. Oh, I guess I'm being directed here. My apologies. We'll do our best. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Alex Mitchell. I'm with Fox Global um, here in D.C. Um, I had a question that's more along the like, cultural and societal um, aspects of this conversation. Um, you know, what is it going to take um, as far as an attack to get uh, more political pressure on lawmakers, on the government, to start taking actions um, that, that are more preventative towards cyber attacks? You know, for instance, if in an armored van went up to the Office of Personnel Management and, well, you know, drove away with a bunch of records or the same thing happened at the DNC, I feel like there would be a lot of more upward pressure. And um, I just feel like, what's it going to take? Great. Is a concept too abstract for people to grasp? Right. Um, We're really short on time, so I appreciate the question. So, so about 30 seconds each. So, Go ahead. So um, here's the thing. When you buy a computer and, 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 and you leave it there and you don't do anything with it, it's no good a few years later. It's no good because it's easy to hack and so on and so forth. One of the things that lawmakers have not understood is that in order to provide proper security, we have to fund maintenance. And maintenance is just as important, more important than the initial funding. So that's a, a serious thing. The other thing is we haven't gotten responsible about mm -hmm. holding companies responsible. So when there's a data breach and I get right. two years worth of credit uh, report for free. That's not enough. Got it. But but to be fair to his question, he's saying, what can you do to bring pressure? I mean, one of the really obvious questions is, at what point does this ethereal cyber stuff that seems so distant become kinetic, where you see things begin happening in the tangible world? I mean, is that what you need? I mean, that's essentially what you're asking. Do you need that to happen, a disaster to happen, that's physical and things, you know, can be seen and felt, as opposed to just theorizing the fact that this is really bad so, stuff. Suzanne, so, so in short, we've last, got a minute. Two days before Christmas uh, last year, uh, there was a cyber attack on the electric grid that brought down power for a quarter of a million people. Uh, this is not academic. This is not ethereal. It didn't happen here. It happened in Ukraine, right. but it happened. Uh, I think, actually, we've, we, again, we've made great progress in getting mm -hmm. this into the boardrooms of companies all across the country. Congress has actually acted in a bipartisan fashion uh, to enact uh, five or six uh, cybersecurity legislation, including, very importantly, automated information sharing, liability protection for companies that sign up for our machine-readable, machine-to-machine, near real-time sharing of cyber threat indicators. Uh, and that required Congress to come together around some you know, tricky issues, and they, and they enacted it. So uh, I, we, we have had the attack. Uh, we do have people's attention. Uh, and Congress is, is actually taking some action on this. There is a lot more to be done. Matt, last word. Well, I'll go back to the terrorism analogy, kind of bring it back to the 9-11 anniversary, which is uh, there are all the tools of national power that we can bring to bear. So cyber responses are one way to respond to an attack. But there is a whole realm of other ways, from diplomatic to intelligence uh, to law enforcement to prosecution. So there's a range of tools that we can bring to bear uh, when, we, when we can attribute an attack. Uh, but I do think as much as the cyber legislation on information sharing was, was a great start, it is sort of just the beginning, I think, to your point. I wish we had a couple more hours. This is fascinating. I wanted to ask you what you all, whether you guys dream about all these kind of disastrous scenarios. But uh, uh, we're going to end it there. But I want to thank very much uh, Susan Landau with Worcester Poly Polytech Institute, Matt Olson uh, with Iron Net Secu Cybersecurity. I actually do like the name. Uh, and Suzanne Spalding with the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you very much. And young lady, next time I'm up here, you get the first question. Thank you.